Marvin, there are two classic kinds of solutions to the mind-body problem. This question about what are we really? What is the essence of a human being? On the one hand, materialism, it's all in the brain. On the other hand, there's something extra, a spirit and a soul, an immortal soul, something. Those are the two big, big questions. A lot of other possibilities that philosophers come up with, but those are the two big categories. You've looked at this in great detail, particularly from the standpoint of machine intelligence and artificial intelligence, and what can a machine ultimately do, and, and, and how can that help us with these solutions? Well, it's hard to say anything about what a machine can or can't do because a machine is anything you want to <laughs> uh, call it. Uh, take a lot of objects and put them together and see how they interact. And most of the time, nothing will happen. If I take a lump of clay and squash it, <laughs> it just sits there. Uh, if you have a source of energy and uh, if you have parts that have multiple states and each one can influence ones that it's uh, connected to in some way, then you can get complicated processes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, as far as I can see, that's all there needs to be, all there is. People could say that a person, uh, we know how a person is made more or less now that we understand a lot about genetics and a lot about biochemicals and we know how muscles and neurons and all sorts of things work to some degree. Uh, and you could say, well, we don't understand how people uh, feel. Well, but the answer is we're just beginning to understand complicated systems that have hundreds of parts. Computer science is only about 50 years old, and that was the first science that could uh, describe how many very complicated systems interact. Mathematics is only good when you have, say, uh, 10 or 20 assumptions, and then you can prove some mm -hmm. things about it. If you have a 1,000 assumptions, mathematicians are helpless. But with a computer, you might be able to simulate it and try different conditions and find out a lot about it. I but if we look to the future and look for uh, computers to continue to grow in artificial intelligence, so-called strong artificial intelligence, uh, can these kinds of computers not only simulate what we do, but really have exactly the same conditions that a human being would 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 feel and experience as well as produce? Well, I don't see why they wouldn't be the same as us if they have the same processes. What one thing we know about computers is it doesn't matter what they're made of as long as they have the same processes. So uh, once uh, some of my students made a machine that played tic-tac-toe out of sticks and spools and <laughs> pieces of string. Yeah. And uh, it played a perfect game of tic-tac-toe, <laughs> and that was fine, and we could make a computer do the same thing. But if the parts are interrelated by the same functions, then the things should have the same behavior. Now, the behavior is understood. I would agree that you can have the same kinds of outputs, the same calculations, the, the, the same analysis, maybe the same uh, kind of musical uh, compositions one can write. But the fundamental question is, no matter how complicated you make your computer with even more parallel processes than the brain has, m however long into the future, with the same number of connections or, or many more so, orders of magnitude more, will that machine have the same internal experiences that a human being does? Well That's the key question. Well, of course it will, because experience is a process. And if you take a particular experience, if you knew how to describe the mental processes, what are their parts, how are they related, how does one, uh, how does it go from one state or another, you would have described all the uh, details of that experience. What's the mystery? Well, uh, there are many people who think that that is the great mystery, uh, philosophers who, who are even atheists, uh, as well as people who come from a, a theological tradition, believe that this is the core uh, piece of evidence okay. that shows <laughs> there's something extra, some, some soul that we need to inject to make a human consciousness, that you need to marry some sort of a non-physical thing with a physical thing. That sounds just plain silly, because how does a soul help? Unless you tell me what are a soul's part and how do they work, you haven't answered anything. All you've done is provided a word to keep you from thinking about the hard question, namely, how does, when I see something red, 
you could, mm -hmm. some philosophers say, well, that's very mysterious because there's this redness uh, and we can't explain it. Well, that's silly, it seems to me. When you look at a red thing, uh, you have a red T-shirt, turtleneck. <laughs> uh, I see it, but we don't see the same thing. We don't have the same experience. Because when you see red, you have many decades of experience with different things and different colors. And maybe red reminds you of roses and sunsets and so forth. And maybe red reminds me more of blood and, and getting a cut and uh, the inside of an animal's mouth and so <laughs> forth. And there isn't any redness. There's a very complicated process that goes on in many different parts of the brain when you see red. It varies from one person to another. And it seems to me adding a soul to do that, that, that just sounds like an uh, insult. <laughs> uh, I've got uh, 50 billion synapses and uh, 150 trillion. <laughs> uh, this experience, so-called, of redness is a complicated process. And uh, in chapter 9 in my book, I try to explain some of it. But I think it will take uh, a very thick book someday. The people who talk about a soul are just people who are too ignorant or unambitious or lazy or I don't know what insults to hurl at them <laughs> to say, this is a really hard question. Uh, it, it's all very well to say it can't be answered, but uh, well, the argument what do you do with somebody who says this question can't be answered? You say this is an unambitious, uh, faith-ridden person. <laughs> well, they say it's not only can't be answered, but can't be answered in principle no matter how much knowledge and science advances, it's impossible to answer because of this so-called inner experience. That but think of the hubris and the preposterousness of a person who says, I know this question can't be answered. That's the strangest thing for a person to say with a brain with 50, <laughs> 50 trillion synapses. Yeah. He's saying, I don't know how to do it. That's all right to say. To say no one can do it is to say, I'm so smart that I can predict that nobody else will ever get a better theory. <laughs> And that's how I view those philosophers. They're saying, I'm so smart, and I can't solve it, therefore no one else can. <laughs> what a strange thing to say. And how come anyone else respects them? <laughs>